the audience is getting quiet. That must mean they're expecting us to begin. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. It's wonderful to see such an interesting group of uh, people turn out for our Fred Fredly seminar on the fate of civic education in a uh, connected world. Now, a Fred Fredly seminar, in case you're not familiar, is not one of those where each of the five speakers takes uh, 15 minutes to give their five-minute introductory remarks and leaving uh, 30 seconds at the end for one question. <laughs> Uh, we are, in fact, have done no preparation. Uh, we've all done lots of thinking over the years on this important subject. And we're very quickly going to move, as soon as I finish, with uh, a little bit of formalities and uh, introdu introducing my uh, colleagues here uh, directly into the conversation. And we're going to involve you in the conversation, too, as quickly as, uh, as we can. So let me give you a few um, uh, a little bit of background. First of all, I'm Harry Lewis. I teach computer science here at Harvard. And it's been my great privilege to be associated with the Berkman Center for Internet and Society for the past several years. Uh, I want to thank the Berkman Center very, very much for sponsoring this evening's program. And in particular, before I do anything else, I want to thank the amazing Amar Asher, who's standing in the back there, for helping us to pull this together, organize everything. This is not the only thing he's been doing over the last uh, several weeks, uh, but he's uh, done a beautiful job with us, so we really appreciate it. Now, this seminar came together um, to time to some degree to coincide with the recent publication of a couple of uh, books, and uh, I have essays in both of them, as it turns out, and I will tell you more about our other panelists' participation. These are, in fact, available for sale back uh, there. The Harvard Coop has kindly uh, brought some copies, as well as copies of the Harvard Sampler on general education along. Um, one is the volume edited by uh, David Feith uh, called uh, Teaching America, The Case for Civic Education. And uh, it has essays by people ranging from Sandra Day O'Connor to Alan Dershowitz to Bob Graham and lots of other people. Um, the other one is a volume called What is College For? The Public Purpose of Higher Education, which is edited by me and by the first of our panelists, who is sitting immediately to my right, Ellen Conliffe Lagaman. Ellen is the Levy Professor of, uh, at Bard College, Levy Research Professor at Bard College, and a senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute and a distinguished fellow at the Bard Prison, Prison Initiative. Previously, she served as Dean of Harvard Graduate School of Education. Peter Levine is director of CIRCLE, the Center for Inf Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, research director of Tufts University's Jonathan Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service. Um, Elizabeth Lynn is the uh, founded the um, project on, oh, I should say, Peter Levine also has an essay in the David Fife volume. Elizabeth Lynn founded the project on civic education, guided its evolution into a national resource center for reflective discussion about service philanthropy and civic engagement. She's now a senior research fellow in humanities and civic life at Valparaiso University. And Juan Carlos de Martin is faculty co-director of the Nexa Center for Internet and Society at the Politecnico of Torino, Italy, which he co-founded in 2006, a computer engineering professor with research interests focusing on digital media processing and transmission. He has been broadening the scope of his attention to the more general theme of the interaction between digital technologies and society. Um, as I said, there will be plenty of questions, but the questions and uh, will, like this entire event, be recorded. Uh, when it comes for discussion, I don't know when we'll break into that, push the button in front of your microphone and be sure to push it off when you finish asking your question and be prepared for your words being recorded, posted to the Berkman Center website along with the entire transcript for time immemorial. Um, uh, for those of you who want to tweet, our Twitter hashtag is up there. It's Sharp Berkman Center, Sharp Berkman Civic Ed. And I think that's about it. So with that, by way of preliminaries, I am pleased to turn the ceremonies over to Charlie Nesson, William F. Weld Professor of Law at the Harvard Law School and founder and faculty co-director of the Internet 
the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, a.k.a. Fred Friendly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Harry, start us off. Um, you convened this event. Something got you out of bed to do it. What, what is the occasion? Why, why do you think we should actually spend time with this subject? I, 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 because the country desperately needs it. I mean, we're so totally, it's, it seems to me that we're, the, you know, as a nation, we've, we're kind of in this despair about the, taking any pride in the, the functioning of our government. And as a university, we pretend that the, we don't have any role in trying to make the people we're educating understand how to make the country better. So there just seems to me a, 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 a dissonance between what the country needs and what the uh, university is doing. So make that case for me about the university. What do you mean? We're not, you think we're not doing our job here? We're not doing a, well, okay, so what's, so what's our job? <laughs> Yes, I think we're I think we're missing a piece of our job, right? Give it to me. What's the job? All right, now civic education. What's my job? So, are, so what? So what? What is the job of civic education? The job of civic education is to see that in the years students are in the possession of the university. There's a dissonant note. You can see you didn't like that. <laughs> Well, the, 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 the around and being in the environment of the university, shall we say, um, that, that, that they learn something about the institutions and culture that support the processes of democracy. Well, now, I, I'm deprived because I never had a civics course. Neither I did really, I. I. I really don't know what it is. And when I was... Well, you had an American history course. When I've been reading here, I, I found... Well, I haven't yet been enlightened, but I'm delighted to have on the panel people who spend their time reflecting about just what civic education is. So, Elizabeth, you, as one who reflects, you do, you reflect on this. This is your job, yes? And you lead others to reflect? Yes. So, open us up. Tell us, what is civic education? have taught more about civic reflection than civic education and specifically on how you get people in their civic work in their capacity as citizens to reflect on the choices they're making so when I think about civic education I start wanting to ask not just what the job is but whose job it is and to broaden it out from what you're suggesting Harry uh, well beyond the university that I think that the civic educator is not just the professional educator, but it's every person in civic life in their actions. So it's people on school boards, it's people in community meetings, it's politicians. We're continually educating others on what it is to be a citizen. And I think we're not doing a good job of that, in part because we're not adequately reflective. Uh, we're very active when we're engaged <coughs> civically, but we're not reflective about what it is we're really trying to do, what the purposes are. When you say, I heard it in there, what it means to be a citizen, is that what civic education is? It is certainly aiming at the development of the person as a citizen, in my view, but I would be glad to cede the microphone to others here. <laughs> well, I was, gonna, I was actually going to pass it to you, Ellen. You have this book about how... We have this book. You have this book about how it should be taught. Yes. Yeah, but all right, so we must know what it is. What is it? Well, I think that it is coming to know better and better how to think about and take action about public problems. So it's a combination of thinking and knowing stuff. I think you need to know about the Constitution and American history. It's reflecting, but it's also knowing how to take purposive action about the problems that define us as a community. So one of the things that interests me is how you can go from the traditional notion of schooling or going to college as studying something, learning how to be something, and actually practicing the enactment of that something. And the something is taking responsibility for the collective situation in which we find ourselves. Taking responsibility for the collective situation. <laughs> and Peter, you nod your head. 
and this, you are, you are the author of Mission for Schools in Civic Education, so you must know what the mission is. Is it just this? I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to amend that. I'm very surprised to find myself on a panel where someone else says exactly what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I like Alan. Can we, can we have a replay of Alan's? <laughs> uh, um, one of the problems with this panel, Peter, just to let you in is, yes. But you all think a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do I we know. have an opponent yeah. to civic education here? <laughs> no, but that definition was a bit controversial because it didn't say that um, it didn't say a bunch of things. It didn't say that you should know a, a whole bunch of facts. Um, the way that we actually assess civic education is to find out whether people know that there are two branches of Congress and two houses of Congress and three branches of government and so on. And so it, that could be useful to Ellen's ends, but it's wait, not go, the definition. Go slower. The way we find out is we. Do what I didn't hear. We test people on whether they know how many uh, votes it takes to get a, a bill through the House of Representatives. I see. I see. Right. So it's how many senators are states allowed? Right. That would be and considered if they don't an know the easy answer, question. They don't know civics. That's right. But if they do know the answer, oh, right. They get an A in civics. Pretty much. So right. civics is about a bunch of facts about how the government works. Right. Right. Wrong. Well, I would, I would, uh, no, so if you start with Ellen's excellent definition, um, you, you find yourself um, valuing that kind of knowledge to a degree, but it's, it's instrumental to the end. So we, the American people, in solving our problems, do operate in part through the federal government, and so it is helpful for people to know that, uh, how, how Congress works. But, but it fits in a subsidiary way on a quite a long list and I'm not even convinced that it's essential for everyone to know it. It's certainly, in, it's certainly inadequate. So Juan Carlos, just to mm -hmm. have you dip into this to begin with, is this a discussion you have anything to do with? <laughs> I mean, you're an Italian, right? It's like you're not an, an American. Right. So what have you got to do with civics? Well, some of the, the issues are, are clearly the same. Some sensitivities, sensitivities are different. Meaning that, for instance, there is less discussion about civic role of universities in Italy, as far as I can tell, and in general in education. We certainly have six civics in the sense that just been described. The basic facts, which are teaching the constitution, our republican constitution, teaching how the government functions. But that, as has been said, is just the first uh, unnecessary but not sufficient condition because knowing that allows you to start thinking about the real deeper issue. And since we're discussing about uh, civic education at the, in higher education, so in universities, I'm interested in the second layer. Okay, we have to know how government functions, but uh, uh, somebody going to university should also understand what's behind that. Because what's a deliberative democracy, just to take maybe the most difficult of the concepts, it's a difficult issue to understand deeply. Why a deliberative democracy and not a direct democracy, for instance? So that's what I would expect any people going to university spending at least some time thinking about that. Because otherwise, what we have seen in Italy in the last 17 years is that somebody like Berlusconi comes along and uh, very easily can manipulate the concept of democracy and make it become, so not, th not the theory, but the practice, something radically different. So Harry, to come back to you. Here we are at Harvard and there's an Occupy movement here. Is this not civic education right in our midst? Well, I, I, I wanted to pick up on what Juan Carlos had to say. I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question, but the, 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 uh, that's a great example of, I think, a failure of civic education. I, I would bet if you took the Harvard graduating class and asked them to explain um, the relative merits of a direct democracy, which is now, for the first time in human history actually possible, right? We could all, everybody's got the little buttons on their, on their desktops. We could, we could have a direct plebiscite on, on any issue that we wanted, on the, the uh, whether to close down all of the, the embassies or you know, anything like that. It's technologically feasible now, and I'm not connecting to our, uh, our, uh, you know, our, t our title here, and a deliberative democracy, you know, should you have, wh why do we bother electing these people? Why don't we just have the people make the decisions themselves and have a, have a, have a real democracy, you know, where the people really make the decisions? I'll bet that uh, people haven't thought about that kind of question while they're in college well enough to give an answer 
uh, that you would hope that the future leaders of the free world would be able to give you. So that's, that, that's a great example of what I'm, why I'm worried about the, the uh, dissociation of the university from these matters of uh, broad civic concern. I think there is, a, I, th I think as, as far as Occupy, uh, Occupy Harvard goes, I think it's amazing how um, the only point where Harvard has brushed up against it thus far, I think there's actually, I think the Occupy movement itself has organized a panel later this week. Am I right about that? When it's some, some happening, there's a panel in the Science Center later this week? Anyway, but there's been, a, the only discussion that I've seen about it from official Harvard is, has to do with protecting people's rights to protest and protecting their safety and all of these questions about the circumstances of uh, where the edges of free speech are, which is good stuff for people to think about, but it has nothing directly to do with the Occupy movement itself. So the Occupy movement is raised questions about income inequality and so on. Um, and they, I, I guess I should be, Fair, I guess Professor Mankey was trying to lecture about that very topic the day that, that the yeah, students walked up and stood up and walked out. But, there, but there's been a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, disjunction. What, what a great opportunity for, for, uh, for having some, some genuine civic education precipitated by a, a, you know, an event that's actually happening on campus. And yet what surprises you is that there is none. There is none, right. So if you're going to give grades to Harvard, you would say we do a lousy job of teaching the doctrine. I, I, don't, th I don't think Harvard is any different from, from any of the other comparable institutions, the although I'm not you know, the best person to comment on that, but I don't have a sense that higher education in general is engaged. We're indeed the leader in not teaching <laughs> 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 So you'd say that we're not doing a good job teaching it in a doctrinal classroom sense. Well, no, no, I, I wasn't talking about a doc, not necessarily a doctrinal classroom sense. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that every, every you know, class in the theory of computation should suddenly abandon its mission and talk about Occupy Wall Street for the week. But we've got a lot of smart but people around But somebody you here. should know about deliberative democracy and you should know about representative you democracy. You should at least be able to talk about it. And on the other hand, it. when it happens right in our midst, we ignore it. So we neither teach it nor engage with it. We just, it just, what are we doing here? We're doing something else, but not civic education. We're, we're doing teaching and research, right? Uh -huh. Ellen. You know, a another example at Harvard and many places, Harvard is not unusual this way, but Phillips Brooks House may be very active in engaging students in all sorts of projects that are interesting, worthwhile, and so on, but it's set apart. It's not part of their curriculum, and it's certainly not part of their concentrations. And unless the academic side of higher education, all the way up through professional schools and graduate school, I don't think it should just be college, unless the academic side of things is integrated with one's engagement in the quote unquote real world, I don't think you're getting a civic education. So it, it's a question of a place like Harvard and many, many other places really rethinking the balance of what they're doing. I mean, to have academics apart from this kind of engagement is to really have it be academic, academics in a sense. And, and I think that weakens the academics and weakens the core mission of the university. So uh, it so sounds as if we're quite agreed that civic education is not being well taught. Peter? Are we sure that, so I, I was intrigued by Harry's very negative uh, guess about the, what Harvard students can do on this topic. I, would be a little surprised. I, I, we should have, a I have nothing to do with this university, but <laughs> there are some out there. Maybe we can ask them can <laughs> through it. But I, I would think that uh, I guess where so I agree with everything that's been said except the di except the um, the evaluation of what's going on. I, I I'm much more sanguine about uh, the, the the concerns. I th I think, for example, young people even before they go to college, and most of them aren't going to get anywhere close to Harvard do pretty well on the sort of standard measures, including those which are um, a little more theoretical and which raise questions about representative versus direct democracy. Um, I'm more worried about two things, uh, dramatic inequalities in the amount that people learn, which are not 
questions of Harvard versus another university, but between four-year colleges, two-year colleges, and no college, mm -hmm. and not finishing high school, which is sort of the, right. the four steps of the ranking system for America. But, and the other, th the other thing is, I don't think people know as much as they used to know about the nuts and bolts of civic action at the community level because of a deep hollowing out of the actual experience of civic um, participation in the United States. So they probably, I think they can probably do all right on a question about representative versus direct democracy. I'd be surprised if they can't. I'm a little less sure that they could, uh, could manage a, a city budget. What is your explanation for why civics is in such bad repair? I would say it's because colleges and universities generally have given up conversations about what their purpose is. And it's assumed that the purpose of going to college is to boost your income. I mean, we don't even need to talk about it. And so, you know, the aggregate boost in income is meant to be what we're all here for. And in the process of just kind of assuming that, it's a good thing to go to college. People don't even question it. Um, I think there has been a loss of conversation about the responsibilities colleges and universities have, not only for civic education, but for cultural engagement, all sorts of other purposes beside the go, economic. Go, go with me, all right? I, I assume I run the college, all right? I'm running uh, basically a large-scale entertainment for students. They come here, if we don't entertain them, they don't come to class. Right. And my problem with civics is that it's boring. <laughs> it's boring. No, it's not boring at all if you get out there in the world. Not at all well, if you're engaged with the real problem. Well, well, well who's, whose story are you telling? What is, what's, the sto what's the narrative? Well, of, what's the basic narrative of civics? Who's the main character? Who's the hero? What's the story? What are the challenges? Well, one, one of the stories is the story of the person who is sitting on the board of that college or university. I mean, when they're on a university board, they are civically engaged. They are actually stepping out of their quote unquote professional life or their private life and doing something <coughs> supposedly to express their values for the larger world. But there's no conversation on university boards about what that means. So I think one narrative starts with the people who are making the decisions, getting them to talk about and think about the purposes, as Ellen was saying, of what they're trying to do. Apparently something like 95% of colleges and universities have the word civic somewhere. or service or citizenship <laughs> somewhere in their mission statement. Um, so start right there and challenge the people who are approving this rhetoric to explain what it means. Because once you start to dig into those terms, you get into some really interesting debates about who we are as a democracy, but we've just stopped digging. We've stopped asking questions of one another because I think we're fearful of treading on other people's points of view because it's gonna cost us money. Okay, so let's start right there. Civic education. Well, education first, education. I, as I've indicated, I have a kind of bias in education towards the narrative. I think, I think telling a good story is the way to get something across. Civics, what, is it, what does civic mean? What does it come from? It must be from the Latin, you, you uh, Juan Carlos. Your language is more closely related to Latin than <laughs> It comes from city, of course, it's civitas. Civitas and uh, civic, civicus mm -hmm. uh, of the citizen. So the education of a citizen, that's where you started. The education of a citizen. So somehow the citizen is the hero of this story. But uh, is it just one citizen? No, it's somehow the abstraction of citizen. <laughs> Is it American citizen or is there a citizen of the world? Are, are we talking about American civics or are we somehow talking about world civics? Should I go? Yeah. I think it's both a global or at least, at least certainly a Western uh, discourse and a national discourse, meaning that uh, 
the values upon which uh, the US and uh, Italy and Germany and France are based are values that developed uh, in Europe in the starting from the Renaissance and then in more modern time in the 17th century and then definitely in the 18th century. And uh, these, these values, which are now, you can find it in the Human Declaration and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you can find it in the Italian Constitution and the US Constitution, so all men are equal, and uh, deliberative democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Those values, uh, we can call them global, at least in the Western sense. And, uh, but then each individual nation have their own history for fighting and achieving in practice those goals. So the US and the American Revolution, your wonderful narrative, since you're sensitive to narratives. But we also have our you know, post-Second World War narrative, resistant to the fascists and to the Nazis and the new Italian rep uh, Republican constitution, the same in Germany, the French, and so on and so forth. So I think there is uh, an opportunity to talk about civic education or the civic role of universities, which is actually the concept that I prefer, um, s explaining why these values now they are defined universal. So somehow most countries in the world, that at least in theory, they, they adhere to those values. At the same time also, uh, remembering people of a given nation, their specific historical fight to achieve those goals in practice, which is typically a pretty good story if you are looking for a story. All right, so two things come out of that for me. One is, as we talk about these Occupy movements, we're clearly looking at things that are happening in Harvard, but they're happening all over the world. There's, some, there's something about being a citizen of the world that's somehow expressing itself or trying to express itself. And in thinking about civics in the context of the global environment, it, uh, it, it poses the question to us to make something of this Occupy movement, really examine it, to understand what it is and how it connects with our feelings of how we relate to the state. But then at your national level, you point out quite right, the, this is the fight of people for liberty. The, 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 the hero of this story is we the people. And the challenge is, how do we the people govern ourselves? And the challenge goes through our declaration, our constitution, our struggles as we go forward, but all in pursuit of the question, how do we govern ourselves? And not as a multiple choice question, you know, um, we have two senators and sen it's really a problem. How do we govern ourselves? Yes. No, I just wanted to point that some people in the audience are already raising their hands. Well, I just <laughs> wanted to say that last thought before turning out to this audience. And I want to say in turning to the audience that after we go for a while with the audience, I want to come back to the panel myself. Okay? Can, can, can I just, can I just fin finish one thought on your, your, on your yes, question? Yes, please, why you, please, the, the, please. The question please. Why, why it wasn't happening, and, and, and Ellen gave one kind of answer, but I want to give a different kind of answer, which is that the, the civics of some kind may be in 95% of the institutional mission statements of colleges and universities, but the incentive and reward system by which faculty are incented to do their jobs has nothing in there about that kind of common value system. It's all, the, all the rewards are for brandishments of our, and, de and, and developments of our personal specialized expertise. And so that actually cuts completely across from this kind of, you know, common good, common possess commonly possessed democratic culture that is fundamental to the, we, the story of we the people. So, that, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a kind of economic explanation of why it isn't happening. No, I'm, I, I, okay. I, I see it. And you can ask, well, where's the constituency for teaching it? Where's right. the, uh, whose priority is it? And you go down a long list, you don't find it. That seems right. absolutely true. Okay. All right, now, lovely, would you do me the favor as I call on you, of not only pressing the button 
uh, but telling us who you are, uh, and then making it nice, short, and sweet. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Lippi. Um, we talked about the first C of Civic, but no one has yet mentioned the second C of Connected. Mm -hmm. And so I think there would be many people who would think, in the aggregate, a more connected world would be naturally a more civic world. I'm not sure that would necessarily be the majority view of, say, the Harvard faculty or people who generally live on the top of, of whatever the hierarchy they're in. So, so why is that? Why do many people intuitively feel more connected is bad? And how can we make sure more connected is good? And hold on, I'm going to just get a few before we go. Go, sir. Uh, uh, Carl Hackerainen. Related to that, w there's a very interesting example a couple of, over the past couple of years as Massachusetts has rolled out its open meeting laws. Uh, it involved instruction of every member of town board, city uh, officials, and, and so on. And you had some very practical, tactical things like, do you, is it okay to post things on the web? Is it, or do you have to physically construct a bulletin board outside a small town hall because the town hall is only open for four hours a week, uh, which is the case in one small town in central Massachusetts. Uh, so there, the issue of connectivity and public access, how do you do that and satisfy the requirements of the, the law, coupled with some very good discussions about the, the grounding of the open meeting law in terms of public access to information, whose information is it, uh, what is the role of public officials, many of whom were unpaid, and this may have been their first official training, uh, they are custodians of our, of our work and our information. How do they do that well? So it was, a, it was a very interesting process, mostly left to the municipal attorneys to handle. The, um, it was, you know, and again, in small towns where, where I live, uh, you might have one law group serving 57 communities. And they would send some junior attorney around to talk with the uh, the assembled body and uh, and and just drill on that for two hours. Uh, and many people thought it was unnecessary, but many people were very excited about it. So it was, it was a very interesting example of very practical but also very effective civic education. All right, great. Yes, sir. Um, thanks, my taxes. So um, just before. Uh, we started the discussion, if you were to ask me what is college for, I would start saying, well, it is um, providing you the means to get ahead in life, mm -hmm. uh, get uh, better skills, not really about thinking uh, about your uh, civic education or uh, the betterment of civic experience. And, and uh, however, you know, as the panel started discussing, there is something about the timing that makes it very appropriate to have this discussion today and not 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was, you know, uh, uh, 2001, it was very difficult situations. Nobody was doubting this kind. What has happened, is my question, that makes it so much more uh, appropriate to discuss civic education? Is it the fact that suddenly everybody can feel and act as a citizens of the world? Or it is just a simple phenomenon that will pass? All right, that's an excellent way to bring it all back. And let's just open it up here. It's, uh, the question starts with connectivity. We feel it. We're in this connected space. We've felt the energy of it as people try somehow to be citizens and express themselves. But we're very inarticulate as a full body of citizens. I mean, when have we ever spoken as a full body of citizens? We spoke when we wrote the Constitution. But when else is our voice heard? And so this idea of we the people as the hero of the story and the struggle being to express ourselves in ways that lead to governance of ourselves, it comes into focus with this connectivity in a way that you can feel, you can feel the questions rising. So yes, Peter. <laughs> Um, well, the word connectivity is so interesting, so I've been just thinking in the back of my mind about are we more connected than we used to be? We, 
we, we are in some ways. I mean, I live online as much as anybody else does and spend all my time, you know, in, 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 in sort of in Europe um, almost uh, virtually uh, almost every day in some respects. And the Occupy movement's got its, uh, all its different pe little occupations popping up all over the world. Even in Antarctica, I saw the actual um, <laughs> uh, Tumblr picture. But on the other hand, um, think of the ways we're more disconnected. Um, for one thing, I'm haunted by the graph which shows um, have you worked with a neighbor on a common problem within the last year? Uh, every year, a little lower than it was before, eroded from the 45% to the 15% kind of range over the last 30 years. Or think be about the connection between <coughs> and us and And before you get finished, you'll be bowling alone. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, you know, that was an influential book. Um, and then, and it's, that, that's an example of a statistic from it. But, um, you know, think about the connection we might feel to national government now reflected by 9% of Americans having confidence in Congress when it was in the 90s, in the 1950s. Or think about them, how many million people are in prison? 2.5, 2.5 million, completely disconnected by big well. barriers, right? All, all, but perhaps not. So anyway, all I would say is it's, wh whether we're more or less connected is pretty complicated. We, my final thought would be we just do a lot of research with working class young adults and we just talk to them a lot of qualitative research, and um, they're extraordinarily disconnected, and it's not about the internet. I mean, they actually are carrying devices that are connected to the internet now, so, which is different from even five or six years ago, so now they're sort of online. But they're incredibly disconnected from, yeah. from this conversation. Ellen, you have a thought on no, this? No, well, I, I want to respond to Peter's comment about people who are in prison. Um, in fact, in New York State prisons, which is where I work, uh, people who are incarcerated do not have access to the internet. But many of them are probably better informed than many of us in this room because they care passionately. When you are disenfranchised, you know what you've lost. And I wonder whether the con connectivity that potentially is available to us has made us all more thirsty for real connectivity. Because, you know, I mean, it, it, you may be in Europe virtually every day, but you're not there. I mean, you almost know how distant you are from some of this. And then when you look out at the world and what's going around us and you, you see so much that you may not like and you're not connecting to it very well, I think that may be part of the reason why people are increasingly interested. I hope they're increasingly interested in civic education. Yes. Uh, and, and, and this is why I think it's so important for us to become aware of in a daily way uh, the ways we are civically connected with a very small c uh, and the ways in which we interact with one another as neighbors, as strangers, as classmates, as colleagues and to think of civics as this web that's connecting us because if the connectivity of the internet is going to be positive, it's going to be in part because of the way we relate to each other outside of it. I'm going to give a very quick example. We had a, a municipal election in my small city in Indiana recently. I wrote a letter to the editor supporting one slate of candidates. The online comments in response to this letter were just virulous, uh, had absolutely nothing to do with what I was saying, but there was just a kind of ready spew. On the other hand, I then went, I'm involved civically, and I went to a meeting. My, my people didn't win. I went to the meeting with the people who did win. I had to sit down with them and engage in a mapping exercise for planning. And we started working together again, and we moved forward. And we even joked about the fact that I didn't have a sign in my yard. Now, that's possible in a community of 30,000 people if you yourself are engaged. But if my entire experience was that online offense, then when I walk out of the house and I look at somebody I don't know, how am I going to respond to that person? When I look at the protests on the street or when I go to the ballot box, it's deeply affecting us not to have civil interactions with one another around issues of common concern. And I say take this into every meeting you are in every faculty meeting, every student meeting, how are you listening to one another as you try to move forward on some common goal? How are you talking to one another? That's civics too. So let me pose you a mild hypothetical. Hmm. Uh, let's just imagine 
that sitting here in the audience is someone from, let's say, WGBH. And that in light of the wisdom that they have absorbed here tonight, they've become convinced that what's really needed is somehow to powerfully get across to the American people how important this civic education is. And the way to do it is to do it with the most powerful storytelling that we have available. And so, Harry Lewis, they have offered you a grant. <laughs> and the job as producer of the newest, latest, most wonderful WGBH series that will better than Bronofsky, better than Prohibition, <laughs> better than baseball, better. It's going to be civic education. Now, you get to write the script, Harry. You get not only to write the script, but you get to cast it. Who would you like to be your host? Who would be the most wonderful spokesperson <laughs> to the American public that would put across this charismatic idea of we the people and the story and the challenge. <laughs> well, of course, I'd form a committee to decide it. <laughs> <laughs> well, run the committee. Here we go. <laughs> we, have a, we, have our, we, go. we have our committee right here, so I throw it to the committee and take their advice. Uh -huh. uh, no, I, I want somebody else to take that. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know his name, though I know it's a he. The person who started moveon.org, I would get. Uh, yes, right, right. Um, I would get somebody like that who has thought through carefully how you mobilize people to take civic action. Um, maybe there would, people who, would be some people out of the Occupy movement who would be there. But I think some of the people who have exemplified how you actually do this, how you take action, because education is not just studying something, it's actually practicing something and trying it out and then reflecting on it. Um, so I, I would pick some of them. Well, I'm still a little worried about what it is. <laughs> and just throwing move on up there and having them tell what they did, I'm not sure that I wound well, how, up knowing what it is when I get finished. How did they learn to do what they were able to do to get move on going? That's what I'd want to uh -huh. talk about. Peter, you got a thought? How are we going to are we going to run this program? My thought is you're you're barking up the wrong tree for a kind of an interesting reason. Uh -huh. So I'm I'm in favor of of narratives as a way of persuading and a way of even understanding the world. And um, but um, the civic is a special realm. The, the the old civic books from the 1950s 1960s used the second person singular as the main pronoun. They talked about you. They said you have these rights and you. Uh, you, you have these responsibilities. So, so you were put in the center. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, they probably come across as preachy and I'm not sure they would exactly work, but the shift was to a third person singular civics book. So now we hear about, uh, mainly about um, abstract nouns like Congress doing things, but we also hear about Martin Luther King and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Um, the you, I think, is what's missing. And so I'm not convinced that a PBS television show which beams into your living room in which some very impressive person tells about something going on in, with, in his world or in her world is the way to get you involved. And actually, of course, we don't have to have that as the means anymore. Even PBS doesn't have to have that as the means because they can make it much more um, interactive and creative. But really, this, and this is what has intrigued me about this subject since Harry asked me to participate here, to come at it in a, in a rigorous enough way to actually be saying, what is it? You have put your finger on something very important, it seems to me. If the idea of the subject is you, mm -hmm. that's a very different conception of the subject than we. Uh, if, the, if, right. if, if, the, if the story is the story of we the people, and we the people globally, we the people nationally, reducing it down to you seems like a right. total 
dissolution. I, I think that's a good point. So I would, I would want it to be about uh, you and about we, but not about he, she, or they. That, that is. Uh, we, right. we. This well, is, but we, about you the title of we. this program is We the People. This is the story of We the People. Yeah, but you've got to have a plate. The, the problem with We the People is there are 300 million of us. So mm. it has to be. Say it again, I didn't hear. There are 300 million of us, uh -huh. which makes the percentage of the we that's you rather small. So the, the, <laughs> the, the, you, the, the you has to be, there has to be something tangible about your role as well. So I, I agree. I, over, I made it sound like the, ar you know, the army is an army of one kind of. Individu uh, overly individualistic. It should be we and you, but the interplay between the we and the you has to be explicit and important. So I don't want it to be all just we, because I think if it's we, it trivializes what you, your own role is. Uh -huh. And who would you have as your lead figure? Yeah, I would have you as your <laughs> lead figure when you're, when you're switching it on, which means no, it's not I mean, going to be I'm, a TV show. I'm talking show. about the documentary. You wouldn't yeah, do this documentary. I don't, I don't you wouldn't do the documentary. I the documentary is going to be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not particularly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll watch it, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh -huh. inspired. Uh -huh. No, I, I think that one aspect of the documentary, it could, be, it could be sort of exemplary lives, because I think one of the ways we communicate this story is through biography through those kinds of narratives. And I, I think I would maybe start with Jane Addams uh, because I think that she is the exemplary citizen. And, and, but I would then make sure that in arguing that I created a conversation with others who could say, no, no, no. <laughs> the exemplary citizen is Benjamin Franklin or such. But mm -hmm. I think that Ellen can talk to the power of Jane Addams. But here was a woman who, who lived her entire life in relation to others and acted in every conceivable way, not just one, um, but, but used every means at her disposal to be a good Democrat with a small d. She's an extraordinary person, and her book, uh, 20 Years at Hull House, should be required reading in American civics. Uh, but I think any documentary would have to come with a really good discussion guide and some very creative ideas about how you're going to plant a conversation about this in every place where we the people are now working. Juan Carlos. Not so much about the documentary, uh, but about uh, a university. If you wanted to touch the subject, uh, one way is to look at the ideas. Because the ideas behind the, the current values that we all share, at least in theory, th that go back to the 12th century, are dangerous ideas, are fun ideas. People died for these ideas, but not just in the sense uh, of dying for fighting in the revolution. They died earlier when they were trying to present these ideas, and rulers quickly understood how dangerous these ideas were. So actually, Telling the story, you know, going from uh, how in the 13th century Dante and others thought about sovereignty, because in the end it's all about why some people are ruling over other people. So starting there and moving through, mm. you know, the Renaissance uh, and then coming to the 18th century, the revolutions until the present system. Of course, I'm an academic, therefore I have a love of ideas, but I think it could be made incredibly exciting. Well, that's a truly noble story. That's the story of the Enlightenment. That's the rise of reason. That's the idea that any human being is someone capable of reason and someone capable of being treated with the respect of all, all of them. That's, that, that has dimension. That has, that seems really interesting. So the question then seems, well, there's a competition that I feel amongst the different candidates for what is civic education. At the one end, we've got this dry, dull thing that you test with multiple choice questions <laughs> about how many things and what it says here and so forth, and it's a dead loser as far as lighting <laughs> kids up in school. On the other, and we have the rise of the notion of equality. We have the inspiration that infects the revolutions in multiple countries and our declaration and we commit to all men created equal and then we challenge ourselves by writing this constitution to try and 
make it. That sounds like it's got real dimension. So if we come back to the responsibility of universities, can it possibly be that the history department doesn't recognize its responsibility to open our students to the story of enlightenment and how it engages the actual struggle for liberty? Is this something the government department doesn't see as like government 101? Or how is it possible that, that a subject of this dimension that you describe, not just politics, it relates to culture in many respects, how can this be that it's dropped out? What, what, what has taken it over? Is it like we're all dying with economics? Is that the <laughs> idea? <laughs> has it? I, I want to know from the people who look like students in the room whether it has dropped out. Well, good again. Hit a button. Tell us who you are. I'm Tembo Lee. I'm a senior at the college. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that the three of you in the middle have espoused three uh, subtly different conceptions of civic education, uh, starting with Juan Carlos. Uh, you've talked a lot about the idea of narrative um, and, and almost in a sense of what uh, people have done. Um, uh, Peter, you've talked about uh, the idea of you, what you should do. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elizabeth? Um, no, I'm Ellen. That's so, Elizabeth. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ellen. <laughs> and, and you've talked about uh, by God, we're going to kick you out the door and you're, you're going to start a whole house on your own. Um, it almost seems to me that the further we get to your conception, Alan, the more we uh, perhaps uh, touch upon the issue of, uh, of, of, of a serv uh, civic virtue itself, of, of the a basic idea of democracy, which is that everyone has their a freedom within the law to do um, you know, what, what they want to do. Um, so as, as we get closer to that line, you know, what... Um, you know, how, how should we think about that problem? You know, how, how far should the university go or early education should go in, in uh, inculcating values as well as encouraging people to actually pursue certain actions uh, within the well, You know, realm? one of the things we don't do is encourage students to learn about social problems by going out in the world. So, for example, we've started teaching seminars and we call them seminars in the civic arts. And we will pick a big public problem it could be public schools. And you start off by reading uh, the best sociology, anthropology, history, and so on that you can find. But then you actually go into the field and test what you're reading by what you see, by what you learn to talk, talking with people, by what you learn by engaging with the actual problem. And I think that's a much more effective way of teaching civics than sitting people down in a classroom and just having them learn American history, however noble it may be. And I think you can do that kind of thing in history classes, in, in almost any field and discipline that's taught in the university. Others? Yes. Hi, my name is Aurora. I'm from Canada. Um, and um, on what you just said, I, was, I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit on the forms of engagement and the channels of engagement for young people or citizens in finding that balance between being active citizen and reflective citizens. Mm -hmm. And because um, it seems that now with that greater connectivity, you can, you, know, you can be an activist on Facebook and just click on something. Um, you can also do an internship in a local community when you're at school. Um, and I just wanted to, um, I guess, have your opinions on that balance between how to get people engaged and maybe even make it trendy to be an active citizen um, and having a space to think about it and reflect on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I know that's broad. But <laughs> if, if I could just um, observe that one of the ways that many, many, particularly young people, are getting engaged these days is through AmeriCorps which is kind of a sort of, it's a, you know, an easy next step after college for folks who don't know what they want to do necessarily quite often. But it does allow people to engage in various forms of service in their community. Um, and AmeriCorps has a civic engagement training requirement. Mm -hmm. So they have built into it a regular educational component. 
we've done a terrible job uh, in resourcing that training so that the quality of the education that goes on there has been, I think, and Peter can probably comment on this, but somewhat abysmal. But I think one of the ways to think about it is where are people acting now and, and what are the requirements for paying attention to what they're learning in those places and how do we take the best things we're doing in the university and bring those into those places. So that if you're an AmeriCorps member and you are being challenged to really think about equality and inequality through your work, and you're also reading the kinds of texts that we're reading in higher education and grappling with the kinds of systemic problems, that's where civic education can also begin. But we have to make reflection a core competency of action in our society. Otherwise, we will never learn from these things we're being asked to do. Could I just ask you about what you mean by reflection? Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm understanding it right, each of us, in a sense, uh, in economic model, uh, we're a rational actor. And yet, we recognize that there's some part of us that has a community orientation. And it, the reflection that you're talking about is that community orientation part of ourselves, yes? No, well the action that we're talking about is that community orientation part of ourselves. It's us acting in our communities in some ways, trying to change them to align them more with our own values. The reflection is just the opportunity to think about how our beliefs are being tested by that engagement because cannot assume that once you get out there and start acting that that's the end of the story. It's actually the beginning of the story. It's the beginning of the story of we the people, right? The Constitution's the beginning of the story, it's not the end of the story. Um, so how do we take these actions and make them schools for learning about what it really means to be in a democracy? It's a, it's a great <coughs> opportunity. Good. Yes. I wanted to ask, um, Professor Lewis at the beginning referred to Harvard students as the Tell future. Tell us who you are. I'm Mark Adenoff from the college, um, the future uh, leaders of the free world. And I was, <laughs> I, I like that in a certain uh -oh. way. Um, but I was also wondering if there's a difference between uh, tra civic engagement in terms of citizenship and in terms of leadership. Mm -hmm. And especially at an institution like this that thinks of itself as training leaders how, how are the demands of civic education different? Well, it just, it just, just ups the ante, that's all. That the, that the uh, you know, when uh, places like this produce so many people who have uh, significant roles in government and um, the private sector, they're, they're, um, they're uh, the, 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 the leverage that the university has over uh, the principles that they may take away, I mean, the leverage that those principles have over the lives of the, the rest of us um, are, uh, are extremely important. So I think it just increases the moral burden of the, uh, of the university to pay attention to this. Um, and, uh, you know, we can look around at people who have had these leadership positions over the last 50 years or five years, whatever time frame you want, who have degrees from places like this. And um, some of them, we're very glad that they, somewhere along the line, picked up some sense of public responsibility. And some of them, you just shake your head in, in despair of you know, what on earth did they learn when they were at whatever university it was. So. That's why I, I, you know, it, uh, that's why I just, it's just an empirical fact. It's not even that we're setting out to educate the leaders of the free world. It just seems to be turning out that way. And so that's our, uh, that increases our, uh, our burden. I wanted to say something while I've got the mic, uh, Charlie, in response to, you, to your, your question about uh, isn't the government department, isn't the history department telling the story and why isn't that, you know, solving the problem? Part of the, 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 the problem is that the, the story is there, but, um, but where, it, in, where it, it, it threatens to engage the world of action that we've been also talking about, 
Um, I think there's a fear that the application of the general principles to current events um, are, is going to result in a highly politicized dialogue, and people are afraid of politicized dialogues in the in the uh, in the in the classroom. That it requires some interpretation, and there are, as we know, many interpretations of how the principles of democracy as as uh, as encoded in our uh, in our constitution and our and uh, uh, our other uh, documents, national documents, a actually apply to the circumstances of the of the real world. Now, you know, in in my view, that just means we ought to have more discussion, not less. But it does tend to shut down discussion sometimes. Well, two things, and then we'll come to you on, sure. Carlos. Both these last questions were kind of asking at least in my mind, a question that goes to whether the, the orientation to civics and civic education it can, be, can be lifted out of the, the zone of guilt trip, mm -hmm. <laughs> where you should know this, and really uh, the American colleges should do this, you know, all that, and to the leadership level, where it's cool to get involved. It's becomes part of, it becomes part of the excitement of learning to get involved. That seems like a huge divide. You know, actually, if you get people more and more out of classrooms, which doesn't mean out of thinking and away from theory necessarily, but if you get engaged in the mess of the world, it's much more fun. And people discover that very quickly. Yes, for sure. All right, well, I'm right. skip. One no, comment, no. go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm replying to you and following on some of the threads. I think the key word is imagination, meaning the capability of imagining alternative futures, mm -hmm. alternative options, okay? So when I was stressing history, it was not, and it's, it's not so, so much of a history department, although technically it, it is, it's reading history to learn, uh, trying to be in the place of those people and try to understand what they felt, the constraints they faced, which are completely different from our constraints, but the tension they had of imagining a potentially new future and dangerous future sometimes for them, and, and seeing how that played out, uh, that's an incredible lesson for somebody in university because you start, you look at the history and you learn from them thinking, okay, what about now, today? And think, you, you mentioned Occupy Harvard. Well, Occupy Harvard or Occupy in general movement is essentially a reaction to a lack of imagination. For 30 years, we just thought there is only one way and everything else is trivial or stupid. And this, at least that's my reading. The Occupy movement is saying, we, start, we have to start imagining again. All right. Yes, please. Hi. Um, my name is Megan Lloydford. I'm a law student here. And I wanted to go back to an issue that was raised earlier about at what point do we have civic education, that you have people not graduating from high school or going to two-year colleges, and not everyone goes to Harvard. And if this is really a story of we, the people, then it's not a story about we, Harvard graduates. And where does civic education come in for everyone else. Where, how do, we, how, do we, how do we educate the American people as opposed just to educating uh, Harvard types? Well, you know, if- See you raising your hand over there, Zitron. Yeah, good, good, All right. we'll hold them off here, good. You know, what, one of the things that's unfortunate in this country is we assume education equals schools, schools and colleges. And in fact, even if you wanted to think about public education in a formal sense, we have public libraries, public television, public radio, and public schools. If we began to think much more comprehensively about those are the formal educational resources at our disposal, to address these issues, we could be much more effective about all kinds of education, not just civic education. But I think it really is breaking out of many of the current conceptions that constrain our imagination about how to do this. 
I mean, newspapers have public functions. You know, the, the New York Times likes to think of itself as a, a newspaper of record. It's going more and more on the internet. Once you're on the internet, there are all sorts of interactive capacities to educate. Do they have a responsibility to do some of this? I would say they do. Peter. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the right question to ask. Um, I, I don't see much evidence that our uh, K-12 schools are doing a worse job at, or, a, or a less, um, there's even less quantity of civic in instruction than there used to be. But I think the context has gotten much more difficult for a fairly specific reason, which is that the, the, we used to have a lot of institutions that recruited large numbers of people in without asking them to come be citizens. They gave you other reasons. They, I'm talking about uh, labor unions, political parties, churches and other religious congregations, and the daily newspaper, the Metropolitan Daily Newspaper. All of these had s motivations to draw you in. And once you were in, they had reasons to instruct you in, in, in civics and to also in, um, inspire you civically. Um, all of those have, are shattered. We do have lots of ways to connect, and I'm excited about a lot of them, including Move On, which has been mentioned, but nothing that has that same function, that same mechanism of drawing people in who have no interest in citizenship and turning them into citizens outside of the schools. Well, not nothing, because for example, not far from here is the National Headquarters of Youth Build USA, which reaches a, a, a lot of young people who drop out of high school and most of whom are court ordered to join, and has a very strong democratic and civic um, education uh, mission, which it doesn't advertise to its recruits at all. It's a bait and switch. So they come in to learn to build houses and get a GED, and they end up with pretty impressive civic outcomes. But youth build is hanging on by a thread, a kind of throwback to an earlier era. And I, so I think in that context, the burden on our public schools is, is greater. We, uh, one final thought is uh, on the same lines is that there's very little evidence that you can get an, an adult who isn't interested in citizenship or very well informed to be involved, Ex uh, absent a, a national revolution. I mean, when, people, when Eastern European revolutions happened in 1989, people were changed. But absent that, you, adults tune stuff out. Young people are extremely malleable, though. So what we need is the very institutions that Ellen listed and I added to the list, but with the express mission of drawing in teenagers, not on a civic, um, with a civic sign over their front door, but letting citizens walk out the back door. And that's what we want. Jonathan Zittrin. So I've been thinking about this. I think citizenship is not something you learn about. It's not a separate zone. It's just something you live. It's not just something you do when you're wearing your citizen hat. Kind of the way that ethics mm. isn't really something you study, and then you get a good grade on it, and then you move on. <laughs> it's like. I want to assure you I have an A in ethics, so what I'm doing is perfectly appropriate. <laughs> and I know people like that. I know it. I know it. Some of them are in jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when we think of it in an, edu an educational environment and start to ask questions like, what's the right age at which to start an education or an engagement with civic concepts and to stop? At some point, is it patronizing to tell graduate students that, you know, if you're going to learn history, you have to be a citizen or live citizenship. I'm interested in the earlier end of it, in part because I think it's when it's lived at a younger age, you just end up breathing it like water the rest of your life. And for that, it seems to me there's two related things going on. One is how do you arrive at truth, which is, of course, central to the educational system. But too often, the answer, especially in the younger grades, is truth is what authority figures tell you it is. Mm -hmm. Trust us, not the stranger who offers you candy in the car. Like, that's the basic, which works for a while, but then at some point, it's got to be something other than an appeal to authority. And it becomes then um, part of citizenship because it's also how do you resolve disputes, including disputes over the truth. What are the mechanisms you have with which to engage with people with whom you disagree? And if there aren't ways to compromise, you can't always cut the baby in half. Even that was a bad idea. Um, how do you end up with winners and losers with the losers not feeling screwed over? And to me, that's the purpose of a functioning polity, to let there be winners and losers, mm -hmm. but not have the losers be or feel wronged, they just lost. And if you look at it that way, this is a, now a concrete question, I guess, for our panel. In those earlier or middling grades, I think about the debate that comes up about whether to teach creationism in schools, for which 
the answer by the elites is no, hell no. And then often there's a fallback from the creationists, well, at least teach the debate. And they're like, no, no, that has no place in science. And I find myself not persuaded by that. I actually think it would be far more interesting to learn evolution in the context of the best possible arguments that creationists can come up with and to see how you sift between them. And to imagine a class in middle school studying that, learning the ins and outs of creationism and the ins and outs of evolution and why one kind of works in the end and one doesn't would be giving them a much better education than just lecturing at them. And in the end, let it shift to a debate on civics by asking them how they would like to see it taught in the public schools. Make it then a civic debate that they can engage in as the people who just came out the other end of the factory. That to me is an example of teaching civics by living it and in a risk-taking kind of way. And I would be curious to see if people would be down with this as a case study of taking civics seriously and realizing that by exposing people to concepts that might be wrong in a context in which authority figures are putting them on an equal par with right concepts, is that doing them a service or a disservice? And, and you, you pick creationism rather than astrology because? <laughs> because there are many people in so our that would be so, that, so, so it's just kind of mob rule. No, it's called democracy, and there are people who are, this is how you treat people with whom you disagree. Yes. If I tell the creationists of the world that they are no better than astrologers and that I'm just waiting for Zeus to pop out of, oh wait, right. sorry, wrong false belief system, like that's <laughs> not gonna persuade them and it's not gonna persuade their kids. So that's why I see it as different than comparing it with astrology and treating the science classroom as a sterile environment into which now now that's a strong man that's okay. a strong man Jonathan so John how much in your conception of it is teaching civil discourse as civics oh I think that is more than half of it how to have a conversation with somebody you disagree with it being okay to disagree and having meta rules for how to have that engagement, that's the link between the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of a functioning polity. The meta rules of politics are how people who don't agree on the policy can still see one affected and the police enforce it. Um, and on the truth side, it's on Wikipedia, how you have an argument and when you lose, you then defend the outcome even though you think it's wrong because you believe in the larger picture. On this point, response, yes. Um, Joshua Gay, an activist, um, hacker, hacktivist, whatever you want to call it. Um, what I find interesting about this discussion is it keeps centering on education and the educational environment as being something of the classroom and something of uh, curriculum. Whereas Dewey, you know, really challenged us to think about uh, the educational environment as a whole and uh, the response to this in its extreme in the 70s were these radical sort of pedagogical movements where, that were really about doing less and guiding students towards working together. So less means, in the case of, say, Harvard, not providing food, shelter, uh, mowing their lawns, cleaning their hallways, and the vast majority of energy that goes into providing so that students don't have to do anything but their homework. And sometimes, you know, maybe not even that. Um, and, and I don't mean that to be snide. Um, I mean it in the, in the sense that this was sort of the feel uh, that drove this, this sort of, these freedom school type, uh, I can't remember what they're called, of, of the 70s, that, that said, you know, and it's not just about taking away. It's about taking away, looking at the whole environment and saying, now you need to look around you and understand how you engage your environment at each step and how you work together and what democracy means in decision making and arguing. And, and, and that can be done through curriculum, through presenting some topic, but it can be done in every aspect of the educational environment. I wonder where you see sort of that reframing of education and our challenging of the institution of education on that grounds. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to help you here, but I'm going to try. One word that was mentioned that jumped out at me 
was sovereignty. The idea of the sovereign citizen. I think it was you that used that. And as I'm listening to John, as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering whether down at the core, before we get to civil discourse, and isn't it wonderful to talk to each other and so forth and so on, there isn't some core concept of citizen sovereignty that actually has to do with the stance. It has to do with the way we regard ourselves and the way we regard others. And the, the notion of, of, of regarding ourselves that way rather than as subjects of the state seems like maybe that's fairly fundamental. And a way to connect that would be to say that if you're sovereign, you're not a consumer. Right, I mean, the, I think the concern about the $50,000 a year college that provides a, and let's use tops my college rather than Harvard, just to be just and fair, that, <laughs> that provides a very nice living environment at $50,000 a year, is that the general message that's being sent is that you pay us a lot of money and we take care of you. And, and certainly to cut back on all the services while we're still charging $50,000 wouldn't go over very well. <laughs> but um, I think the, the sense that you're not creating or constructing or governing the space that you're in is pretty powerful. All right, well, we're just going to wrap up pretty soon here, but a couple more. Yes, go. Thank you. I'm a Neiman Fellow from the Philippines, which uh, partly explains my question. And I hope I'm raising it in the same spirit as uh, Jonathan Zitrain's intervention. Um, I wonder what the panel thinks uh, of uh, Professor Nesson's equating of civic education with master narratives. Um, I think that uh, a master narrative uh, is a working myth, and it works precisely because you take out many things. For example, I wonder how much of the history you want to be taught should include America's turn to empire beginning in, in 1898, which explains the massive expansion of executive power and so on and so forth. But that's not my point. My point is to ask, is it in fact misleading to sp speak of civic education as narrative? Maybe we should speak of it in terms of a toolkit. Mm. So precisely, you have winners and losers, and then you have a winner's history. But if you have a toolkit, then whoever wins, whoever loses, uh, have uh, recourse to the same set of tools and so on. So basically my question is, would you agree with that, that in fact, speaking of civic education in terms of narrative is actually misleading? Well, before they answer, I just want to get clear myself. Uh, are, are you thinking, are you thinking in terms of what will interest students, that, uh, all right, narrative is one way to interest students, but another way to interest students is in teaching them the tools how to win. This is how to win. I'm going to teach you the tools of how to win in competitive democratic process. Is that the idea? I wasn't actually thinking in terms of what would interest the students. I suppose as teachers, uh, and I teach too back home, uh, we have to worry about that. I was thinking more of what should be taught uh, uh -huh. to the students. And then whether we can make that interesting or not is a completely different matter. Uh -huh. Fair enough. Go ahead. You know, I, th I think the toolkit idea is, is very interesting. I mean, I think, in fact, it connects nicely to what Charlie was saying about sovereignty. I mean, the more tools you have to be a citizen, the more sovereign, in a sense, you're going to be. The more self-possession and power to change the world in which you live. So I think the toolkit has to include both knowledge of the master narratives, and there are many, um, as well as capacities to think about them and capacities to act. I think it's those three in combination that are so important. But I think the toolkit idea is a very nice way of putting it. But I would add to that also the, the, the will to act, the disposition, and I think that does come from narrative to an extent, not necessarily the master narrative, but an understanding of our own narrative and our own sense of where we belong, to whom we belong, and, and what it is we care about. And until we help um, ourselves <laughs> as civic professionals and our students 
think about what our own narratives and values are, we can have those toolkits and they're just gonna go in the trunk of the car with all the other toolkits that we pick up and don't ever use. One more. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Sir. Yeah, right there, yeah. Okay, I'm um, Pierre Schmidt. I'm a visiting researcher at UCLA. I'm just on vacation in Boston. Um, <laughs> you address in first place the failure of university as its role with in related relation to a civic education. I was thinking about also the failure of teacher and maybe uh, the role model of teacher. Uh, we kind of agree on the idea of like uh, civic things is about knowing, reflecting, and action. I'm pretty sure that a lot of uh, teachers are really good at thinking and having reflection and stuff. I'm not really sure that a lot of them are a really good um, role model for their students as taking action. Maybe with the speech act theory, we can consider that writing books and making uh, great uh, lectures is a lot of action. But I think maybe there's a lack of action and getting in the world, getting involved, getting engaged. And back to this idea of getting engaged, I like the, our actor there because he said I'm an activist, but then he said I'm an, um, I'm an hacker activist, you know. You cannot be engaged or an activist without relation to a context. And I guess that the first context where a teacher or a student might be an activist or involved or engaged is as a teacher, as a student, in his own environment, you know. And I don't see a lot of teacher in Harvard or in many French university, I'm French, or American university, uh, being a good role model for being engaged in their position as a teacher. But, 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 that, but that just goes back to what I, what I said. This is just, it's just the way the economic system is set up. I mean, that, you know, what, how are professors hired? I mean, you don't hire them on the basis of how activists they've been, right? You don't promote them on the, as to whether they've, they've engaged the world if they're a classics professor or something like that. So, so that, that, that's, 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 that's why, that was the point of my argument about the incentive and reward system. We have exactly the faculties in universities that we should expect to get given what the incentive and reward system is for creating them. And, the, and the, I think that the question about this set of common values that the, this kind of shared concept of, um, of uh, civic, uh, civic education is whether that system needs to be altered if we're going to produce a somewhat more long-sighted set of leaders out of the institutions that are de facto, as I said, uh, especially prone to create them. All right, Harry, it's uh, 725. I think that's... And uh, we want to just bring it together. Now, you're the person that put this together. <laughs> and you've now had the experience of this event. And it somehow should be to you to say the benediction. What, what, <laughs> what, 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 what is, what's our, our accomplishment here? Oh, I think that's a tough one, Charlie. I think, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm gratified to see that there's such strong interest in the subject and that uh, you've all hung around for the hour and a half to listen to a discussion on, um, on these issues. Um, I don't know that I've got a good uh, bottom line. Anybody, uh, anybody else want to offer one? One, Carlos, we can always count on you. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, you can count on me just for a quick comment uh, in the sense that uh, the last question pointed to um, the role of universities, more, more, which is more general than, than civic education. Civic education is one thing that universities can do to accomplish uh, their civic role. So the, civic can be, so the teaching part, then the civic role of professors was mentioned. So for instance, extramural speech is a way of engaging in society. And uh, there are you know, well established uh, rules on what is appropriate for a professor doing extramural speech in topics which are not explicitly that is topic uh, of interest. But also there's the third layer, the university itself uh, as a civic actor, yes. 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 which is we haven't mentioned mm, this evening, but I think it's a uh, it's very t difficult subject. Yeah. 
for many reasons, but still it's an important layer when we talk about the civic role of university. That should be the benediction. <laughs> well, for my part, let me just say, I think this is a wonderful subject, and uh, certainly parts of it that remain to be explored more fully. But at essence, the things that were I to come back to it again and pick up on, I like Jonathan's notion of how the university goes about teaching our relationship to truth. Mm -hmm. Is it by authority? Sure. I'm a, I'm, I, I think we teach truth better if we teach people how to play poker than if we <laughs> tell them what's right. And at core, this idea of sovereignty seems to me to be the universal, the idea of the enlightenment that there is a sovereignty in being a human being, that uh, a, a, our challenges come out of that, that seems worthy. And then all of you focus on engagement, the practicality, the actual willingness to get out and engage, and that that's where the education takes place. That surely seems wisdom to me. So thank you very much, Harry, for putting this together. Thank you all. Thank you, thank members you of the panel. Uh, thank panelists. you, members of the audience, for participating. Thank you.